thank you guys so much for being here. I'm going to turn off the mesmerizing slow-mo video, but I'll put it back on for questions so you guys have something to look at. Um, we're going to go behind the scenes on the photography of modernist cuisine. Now, this applies to the exhibit that's currently at Pacific Science Center uh, through about mid-February. If you haven't seen it, you should check it out. By a show of hands, how many folks have been to the exhibit already? All right, I'm going to make converts out of the rest of you tonight. Uh, this is going to be so, so super cool. So uh, if you're unfamiliar with modernist cuisine, um, let me show you a little bit about who we are. We make uh, really big, elaborate uh, cookbooks. The one on uh, the left uh, of the image there is the original modernist cuisine. It came out in 2011. It is uh, five volumes plus a waterproof kitchen manual, 2,438 pages, uh, and about 50 pounds of book that starts at the invention of fire and goes all the way up through the most contemporary cooking techniques that we know about. Uh, the follow-up came a year later in 2012, Modernist Cuisine at Home. It slimmed down to a measly 406 pages with a uh, uh, its own waterproof kitchen manual, because of course you wouldn't want to get the book wet. But recently we released uh, our first digital edition, Modernist Cuisine at Home, which is available on iPad or it'll run on your desktop browser and it runs on your iPhone too. It's really, really ridiculously cool. Uh, we think everybody should own a copy. Uh, if you don't want to take the full plunge of $79.99, you can try a free chapter or purchase chapters a la carte for five bucks. I, it must be the headset. I feel like selling you guys stuff tonight. Um, but we also have uh, another new book this season, The Photography of Modernist Cuisine. And I just... I want to give you guys a sense of how big this book is. Um, it's really, really big. Uh, and it's just pictures. No recipes, just emphasis on these really beautiful photos. Um, our books are rather complicated. And even our at-home book could be uh, a, a little aspirational for a lot of home cooks. So we thought, well, let's just take uh, the beautiful photos that we've developed for all of this and put it together in a gorgeous coffee table book. And by that, I mean a book the size of a coffee table. Uh, it's all full page photos. Uh, the book is divided into the following sections, which is actually the same way that we've organized the museum exhibit. And we've got a little chapter, uh, a little 38 page chapter in the back on how we did all of this photography. And that's where we're gonna spend our time tonight. I'm gonna walk you through a little behind the scenes of some of the photographic techniques that we use. Now, uh, we cover a pretty broad range of imagery with our photos. There's a lot that captures our attention. But as you can see from this collage, it's not all traditional food photography. There's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't see in sort of a cooking magazine. As I mentioned, though, uh, we, we wanted to make this book really big. So here's uh, the original Modernist Cuisine, which, by the way, is a large book. Uh, this uh, photography of Modernist Cuisine is 60% larger, but we thought that the photos deserve to go even bigger than that, which is part of the reason behind the photography exhibit that we've developed. So uh, here is... Uh, for comparison, the photo book, uh, compared to the average sized image that's in the exhibit, it's about six feet wide. Uh, some of them are even bigger. We've got an eight foot tall hamburger uh, that you can get right up against. So it's a really immersive uh, experience. If you haven't checked it out yet, I highly recommend it. Um, uh, it's a, a great way um, to explore the photography, but also learn a little bit about the science behind uh, a lot of the cooking techniques we employ. So some of the photography that we uh, make at Modernist Cuisine looks like food photography. Uh, it's things like this. So this is a, a tomato shot very close up and in maybe a slightly different way than you would normally see a tomato. It's not on the vine in a field with water glistening off the thing or whatever. This is almost an anatomical view uh, of this tomato. We want to challenge um, the way that you have historically looked at food and give you a new perspective on looking at food. Here's another example. This is a, a head of cabbage. Now, I think this image is gorgeous for lots of reasons. Um, one of the things, though, that, that we use these images for is as a, sort of a lens for science education. So this is beautiful, and it might draw you in, but what is there that we can learn uh, about 
the science of food from studying these images. Well, one of the things is, have you ever noticed that in a head of cabbage, the outer leaves are darker green than the inner leaves? And have you ever wondered why that's the case? Well, it's a phenomenon called etiolation, and it, it basically means that the parts of the plant that receive more sunlight um, develop more chlorophyll and turn greener. Uh, the inner leaves get less sunlight because it's got to penetrate all the way through. This is actually the same reason that white asparagus is white. As it's growing, the farmer piles up dirt around it. It's never exposed to sunlight. Or this, for example, this is uh, red cabbage. No, it's, it's really purple uh, cabbage. Um, but the, the color uh, of this cabbage it comes from a natural pigment called anthocyanin. Uh, this is the same chemical that uh, is getting a lot of marketing activity as one of the sort of miracle foods in blueberries or in acai berries or, or in things like that. Um, it turns out that uh, it serves a sunscreen purpose in these foods. Uh, it actually protects the plant against damage from UV radiation, uh, but it also has the neat property of being color sensitive to pH balance. So you can add a little bit of acid or add a little bit of base and alter the color of your cabbage juice. It's a fun science experiment to do at home. Or this image, uh, this is um, a, a wedge of uh, grapefruit, um, but we've treated it with this very special enzyme called Pexinex Smash. Uh, this is enzyme eats away at that filmy membrane inside citrus fruits. Uh, you can see that the um, vesicles, as they're called, that's, that's what all these little things are, um, are not encased in this membrane anymore. And this is a, a modernist technique that we use as a, way, a different way of presenting the fruit because nobody likes chewy membrane. Or something as simple as colored flames. You may have done this uh, in chemistry class. Maybe it was part of the assignment, maybe it wasn't. Uh, dropping different uh, powdered chemicals uh, into your Bunsen burner and see the color of the flame they produce. So these are some more traditional style photos that we include whenever we're explaining content in our books. But we also have some other signature styles, and this is really where I want to spend our time tonight. Uh, one of them is the cutaway photograph. So when the team was originally developing modernist cuisine, there were all of these scientific principles that they wanted to teach. Uh, in one case, it's this interesting phenomena about uh, the time that it takes to steam vegetables versus boil vegetables in, in various cooking things. Now, you would think logically that steaming would be faster because steam has more energy than just boiling water. In fact, it takes a huge amount of energy to go from boiling water to steam. But it turns out that in many cases, steaming is slightly slower due to a phenomenon called film condensation. Now, if we had just explained that in a paragraph, we probably would have lost you already. But instead, this is how that page appears in the book. It's got this beautiful cutaway of a pot of broccoli steaming and annotations that show what's actually going on inside the food as it cooks. It gives you this magical view of food that you couldn't get any other way. And this became one of the hallmark techniques for uh, mo modernist cuisine and modernist cuisine at home and will be for our future books as well, is using these beautiful visuals to draw you in. Now that we've got your attention, let's teach you a little bit about the science that's going on here. So. A natural question might be, how did you make these cutaways? And we, we have a lot of them. To explain this story, you need to little, know a little bit about where our kitchen is. Uh, this is our kitchen. It's in a discrete location in Bellevue. Uh, it's actually in a warehouse that used to be the Eastside Harley-Davidson repair facility. So every now and then we still get guys bringing in their hogs who look very confused when they walk through the door. Um, we've got uh, this really, really amazing kitchen, but right around the corner under the same roof is a pretty phenomenal uh, workshop, a, a machine shop. This machine shop exists as part of Intellectual Ventures, and its purpose is to do rapid prototyping. So Intellectual Ventures invents a whole bunch of stuff. Sometimes it's lasers that shoot mosquitoes. Sometimes it's nuclear reactors. And when you're making these things, you kind of have needs for parts that are hard to get off the shelf. So we've got this incredible machine shop, and occasionally we use it to cut cookware in half. 
Uh, here's a great example. This is traditional pot roasting. Now, you might think traditional pot roasting, oh, it's pretty simple because it's old. It's been around for a really long time. But it turns out that the flavor of traditional pot roasting is really, really hard to replicate through other means. There's a fantastically complex system of physics at work here. There's the heat being passed up through the bottom of the pot via conduction that heats the water that actually conducts heat straight into the meat. The coals on top cause uh, the top of the pot to get very hot, which radiates heat down onto the surface of the meat. And that radiation causes browning on the outside of the meat, and the browning causes these uh, wonderful chemical reactions that create amazing flavors that then drip down into the liquid that circulates around the meat as steam, and we actually build up a little bit of pressure, and the whole thing is wonderfully complex. And if you described it in a drawn diagram, it would be far less interesting than doing something like this. Um, this is actually uh, how we made part of this cutaway. This machine is called an EDM, or an electrical discharge machine. Um, if you saw the Iron Man movie where the bad guy had the, like, the electrical whips and was cutting race cars in half, it's sort of how this works. Um, there's a filament that you saw at the beginning of this video, and then this pool of deionized water, and then an absolutely ridiculous voltage is passed through this filament. It's like a million volts, uh, and it slices through whatever. It slices through cast iron or titanium or whatever, actually separating the material at the molecular level. Then, for things that require liquids, we actually glue a piece of flat Pyrex glass so that we can boil the liquid inside, which is, which is really cool and, and, and really great. Here's an example from one of our images uh, from canning. You can see the Pyrex glass is glued on front. We've got water inside. It's sitting on top of an induction burner, and we can actually get that water so hot that it boils and take a real photo of that. But there's a problem. The only glue that will withstand the temperatures necessary is bright red. And so how do we make that go away to get an image that looks like this? Well, when you cut a pot in half, you end up with two halves. So we take the first half with the glue on it, and we photograph everything. Then we photograph the second half in exactly the same position, and we substitute the edges, just like taking out you know, wires uh, from a Hollywood movie if, you know, if an actor is flying through the scene. So people ask us, well, do you use Photoshop to make these images? And the answer is yes, but we also use a machine shop. Uh, I think that's pretty cool. Here's another example, uh, a blender that we cut in half. Uh, you can see one of our machinists, Chris, here, meticulously uh, uh, putting small components back together and applying glue and scraping things away uh, so that we could get a shot like this. This is tomatoes in that blender. Now, you might wonder, wait a second, you must have used some camera tricks to get the tomatoes to stand up in this blender, and I assure you we did not. However, they fell out a couple of times uh, during shooting. This is, by the way, our founder, Nathan, here, taking uh, that picture that you just saw. So uh, cutaways are a really cool technique, and we found them to be hugely useful for drawing people in um, to the subject matter, and then we can teach you a little bit about the science. Here's another example. This is one of my personal favorites. This is our cutaway Weber grill. And we use this to illustrate the complex physics at work in grilling a hamburger. This is a simple activity, uh, but there's a lot of misconception about it. One misconception is that the flavor of grilling has something to do with the coals themselves, that if you use a different kind of hardwood, you're going to get this different kind of flavor. That's pretty much untrue. Uh, the flavor of grilling actually comes from these little droplets of fat that you can see falling down onto the coals and then pyrolyzing. It's burning, um, which uh, is another one of these fantastically complex chemical reactions. And then those pyrolyzed things wafting back up and clinging to the meat above it. This is the reason that if you just put zucchini on the grill, you don't get that signature flavor. Uh, so our suggestion in that case is keep a little squirt bottle of liquid fat, put your zucchini on the grill, and then give a few spritz on the coals and the flavor will be much better. Now, this picture is kind of perfect, right? The hamburgers are done exactly right. We've got these beautiful drips of fat coming down. The coals are 
perfectly exposed, but so is the back of the grill, and we've got these flames coming up. How would you ever capture that moment? And the truth is that we create this moment through a number of exposures that we put together. In fact, a lot of our images are mul multiple exposures where we pick and choose the pieces of the image that we want to keep. So this is how uh, this image started out. It's literally the Weber cut in half, literally with coals on it. But as you can see here, the coals get this coat of ash real quick. And you don't get that wonderful dynamic contrast of the glowing coals. You just see these highlights, and then everything else is kind of washed out. So we took this photo. And then we took a series of other photos where we took a blowtorch and held it to one section of the coals and then pulled it away and took a photo so we could get these wonderful hot spots. And in fact, the final image uh, of our Weber grill is composed of over 30 different exposures where we're picking and choosing the moments we want uh, to get exactly this shot. Uh, we also, uh, while we were cutting stuff in half, uh, this Viking rain showed up in the lab, so we thought, what the heck? Um, and we lopped a third of the range off. This was a huge undertaking for our machinists. It took them several days of work. And by the way, our machinists are absolute surgeons. Um, they don't, as you might imagine, just feed the whole machine into a saw in one piece. They actually disassemble it component by component and cut it in half there. And if you think these cutaways are really cool, they're on display as part of the exhibit at Pacific Science Center. So you can get right up close to them and see all of the intricate components uh, next to uh, the final photos of these things. Now, sometimes we cut in things in half that are a little easier to slice. Uh, these vegetables are a great example. It's one of my favorite photos. We also use uh, microscopes for a lot of our um, images. Some of the things that are important in food and cooking happen at a scale that's too small for you to see with the naked eye. So the microscope is a perfect tool. Here's a couple examples. Uh, this is vitamin C. Um, uh, vitamin C has a crystalline structure, um, and the crystals of vitamin C are what's called birefringent. That means when you pass polarized light through them, uh, they refract in a way that gives you this incredible rainbow pattern. And a lot of people see this and, and think it's some type of art piece. You know, it's feathers from something or, or some type of oil painting. I think it's gorgeous. Uh, this is another vitamin C image taken at a different scale, and it's absolutely one of my favorites. It looks like sunset over dunes in the desert or ostrich feathers or, or something else like that. Uh, any guesses as to what we're looking at here? Feel free to call it out. This is potato starch. Um, which is really cool. Now it's been stained uh, so that the starch granules are this kind of magenta color. Um, but this image helps us explain a really neat phenomenon. Have you ever made uh, mashed potatoes and they end up really gummy uh, and thick and like you could spackle your wall with them? Well, that happens because inside these starch granules are these really, really long starch molecules and they're all curled up inside themselves. But if you slice one of these granules open, the molecule comes springing out, and it just kind of acts like a net to catch everything. And at a macro scale, that net is what gives you gummy potatoes. So if you throw potatoes in a food processor, the blade is going to shear all of these things open, and then you end up with gummy potatoes. But instead, if you use a trick that bakers and brewers use, and you uh, take an enzyme, for example, diastatic uh, malt enzyme, it will gobble up all of the starch granules and take these really long starches and cut them down into much shorter sugars, which means that your potatoes don't get gummy and that you don't have to add dairy in order to have super smooth potatoes. So it's a practical thing, um, but also the image is just kind of beautiful by its own merit. This one, a lot of people think, is the storm on Jupiter or some Hubble deep field image. Uh, I hope you guys are done eating. This is trichinella uh, in pork muscle. It, it turns out that you don't really need to worry about trichinella unless you are hunting and eating your own bear meat. It's pretty much been eradicated from the commercial food supply. But if you wanted to know, that's what it looks like. Here's another example. These are uh, venations of a deciduous leaf, which means veins of a leaf, um, uh, but uh, taken through a microscope. Now, 
Under normal circumstances, the image wouldn't be this clear. And the reason is that when you get really, really close up to a subject, as you do with a microscope, you lose depth of field. In other words, the, the portion of the image that's in focus becomes really, really, really narrow. And so you just get this one small slice that's in focus and everything else is blurry. So we use a technique called focus stacking to overcome that. I'll show you an example at a slightly larger scale. This is our chicken soup recipe, and it's subtle, but you can see this going from not in focus to in focus as uh, the focal plane moves further away from the camera. Um, uh, and then this is the final image. So what are we actually doing? doing to construct this image. We use a rig kind of like this. So we've got our camera there. We've got, in this case, a microscope objective, but it could be a regular lens too. At the top is a stepper motor. So this is a motor that moves in very, very small increments and can be controlled by a computer. So we point the camera at our subject. We figure out, okay, what's the top part that needs to be in focus? And then we seek all the way down to the bottom. What's the bottom part that needs to be in focus? And then we do a little bit of math to figure out how thick our focal plane is. And then the computer moves the camera this imperceptible distance all the way down. And we take tens or hundreds or sometimes even thousands of images. And then we combine them all together where you get one image where everything is in focus. Let me give you another example. This is a, a blueberry. This is the stem part of a blueberry. It kind of looks like a landing crater or something. Uh, and this is, this is the final image with everything in focus. But an individual exposure looks like this. Just that top tip is in focus. That's how thin our focal plane is. And then if we zoom all the way to the bottom, just that bottom part is in focus. So in this case, we take maybe 100, 200 images all the way in between. And then we use very special software to arrange the images. Uh, and it looks like this. We actually end up constructing a 3D model out of these flat images. So the computer knows where to use parts of which slice and then can collapse it all together for, for a final thing. Here's another example. This is forbidden rice. It's uh, black rice shot in extreme macro. And uh, when all the images get put into the computer, we get this really cool three-dimensional model uh, that's, that's a lot of fun to play with. And it's le it lets us make images like this. This is a raspberry, but to the scale where you can actually see the little hairs on the raspberry. What I think is so cool about this is that it makes the food seem larger than life. You know, normally our only reference for something where everything is in focus is if that thing is really big. And so when we apply this focus stacking technique to foods, it makes me feel like, you know, it's a gigantic food or that I've been shrunk down uh, to the size of an ant. I, I think it's super cool. Here's another one of our photography techniques. You saw the eight foot burger I was standing next to earlier. Uh, this is levitation. Now, we don't actually go into low Earth orbit to do this, although I've been begging Nathan to let us try that for a while. Um, this was inspired by the exploded parts diagram. Now, the exploded parts diagram has been around for a really long time. This is a Da Vinci drawing uh, that shows it. And you see it in a lot of um, engineering diagrams or patents or, th or things like that. It, it's, it shows you the assembly of something complex exploded out so you could see all the parts. And we thought, oh, well, what a cool technique to show some of the complex things we make. So everything as simple as a mason jar and how the lid attaches to a grilled cheese sandwich. So uh, how do we actually um, make these images? Well, we make them with a clever camera trick. Uh, nothing is actually levitating. We decide how many layers they're going to be and what height and angle the camera should be at to achieve the same effect of looking up at something, to basically make an artificial horizon and look above and below it. Then we shoot all of the layers individually. So here, uh, laser pointer, here you can see the patty that was levitating in midair is actually just sitting on the table. Same with the tomato, same with the lettuce. The cheese that appears to be floating in space is sitting on top of a graduated cylinder and being held out in sort of a magic carpet configuration. Uh, this amazing splash of mushroom ketchup at the bottom is, of course, actually 
just splashing onto a black surface. And then in Photoshop, we combine all this stuff together and make these, uh, these very cool images. Then finally, uh, sometimes in cooking, the action happens so fast that you can't count on your reflexes to capture it. Well, luckily, we have one of these. Uh, this is a high-speed camera. It's called a Phantom V12. Uh, and it can capture um, video up to a million frames a second. Now, we don't usually run it at a million frames a second because that's pretty much just good for watching a bullet pass by. Um, but we do use it to capture some really mesmerizing sequences, like the uh, sort of screensaver I was running when you guys all came in, or this glass of wine uh, smashing open. Uh, this has uh, got to be the team favorite. It's a kernel of popcorn popping. Uh, it turns out that when you pop popcorn, uh, the kernel, the unpopped kernel, has just a little bit of water inside this hard outer shell. And when water flashes from liquid to steam, it expands by a factor of 1600. That expansion creates tremendous pressure inside the kernel. And eventually, the kernel will develop a little hairline fracture through which steam will escape. And that turns it into a steam-propelled rocket. That's how you saw it sort of jumping off of the base. But eventually, that's not enough uh, to relieve the pressure built up inside, and it unfolds and pops. Uh, and that's how popcorn works. Um, this one is showing the uh, oils in the skin of an orange and just how flammable they are. Um, it's a neat bartending trick, by the way. Feel free to try it at home <laughs> uh, to, to get images like that. So I'm going to stop there. I hope you've liked uh, this sort of behind the scenes view. I really encourage you to go check out uh, the exhibit Photography of Modernist Cuisine at Pacific Science Center through February 17th. And if you're interested, uh, these make great holiday gifts. We got Photography of Modernist Cuisine and two recently released stocking stuffer kits, a gel noodles kit and a spherification kit, which are a lot of fun to do uh, with kids in particular. So thank you so much.